Uh, well, good morning. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Congratulations to those of you who have made it after what I assume was last night's festivities. Uh, my name is uh, Mark Littlewood. I'm the Director General of the Institute of Economic Affairs, and I will be chairing this session on how can we best advance liberty. Um, I always think that we spend a good amount of time, I'm not saying a misallocated amount of time, on discussing the ideas of liberty and honing them and looking at things that we disagree about and trying to form the best possible ideas and policies, but perhaps don't spend quite enough, enough time on um, how to actually best win the argument in the external world rather than just framing it for ourselves. It's all very well having the best technical abilities, um, the greatest skills possible, but if you can't actually bang the ball in the back of the net, then you lose to the other side, as Southampton Football Club found yesterday, despite being enormously the better side, lost 1-0. So my kind of football analogy is how can we best put the ball in the back of the net to advance liberty? Uh, we were due to have um, four panellists with us today, but I've just been told that Cody Wilson, the crypto-anarchist best known for his invention of the first 3D printed gun, and considered one of the 15 most dangerous people in the world. Uh, that description is shared by UK Customs as he has just been held up at the airport. We don't know his arrival time, I'm afraid, but it is clear proof that the agents of the state will stop at nothing to try and thwart our best, in, our best intentions. Um, if Cody isn't able to make it for this session, I've been told by the organisers that we'll, we'll do our very best to make sure that he is able to speak to you and, uh, and address you later on today. Um, so let me introduce you to our panelists. They'll each speak for about 10 or 12 minutes, um, and then we'll throw it open to debate and discussion. On my far left is Stephen Davies, the Educational Director at the Institute of Economic Affairs. Uh, on my immediate left is Matthew Elliott, the co-founder of the Taxpayers Alliance, founder of Big Brother Watch, um, former campaign director for the No to AV campaign, uh, currently Chief Executive of Business for Britain, a business group campaigning for a better deal from the European Union. Matthew's a sort of intellectual serial entrepreneur in setting up campaign groups and think tanks. And on my immediate right is Harry Bingswanger, an objectivist philosopher and board member of the Ayn Rand Institute. He's currently a Forbes online columnist and has appeared regularly in print and on screen. And I'm wondering if I can ask one of the organizers to bring some water to the table. We've got um, four neatly laid out glasses, but nothing to actually put in them. So if somebody could sort that out, that would be fantastic. I'm going to ask them to speak in the order in which I've introduced them. So Steve, can I ask you to go first? Uh, thanks very much, Mark. Well, there are lots and lots of strategies uh, by which we can try to advance liberty. And one of the kind of heartening things, if you like, is to realize that in a way, it doesn't matter what particular skill set you've got or what particular talents you may have, there's always something that you can do. And many of the most effective ways of advancing liberty are things that people would often not think of. Uh, what I would say, first of all, is that in many ways, what is most important is to change what you could call the broad cultural climate. Uh, to change the kind of unexamined assumptions that many people have about the world uh, and about the way it works, and about, above all, what is actually possible. I mean, to give you one example in terms of the cultural change, uh, the representation of business and commerce in film and fiction is an enormous challenge, I think, because uh, of course, if you got your idea of what businessmen and business were like from uh, watching Hollywood films, uh, you'd get the idea that basically all commercial businesses and firms are criminal conspiracies against the public interest, uh, whose only goal in life is to sell fraudulent products and uh, do various kind of things like, you know, uh, trying to kill Harrison Ford and murder his wife and all this kind of thing in order to sell a medicine that's going to kill lots of people with liver failure. Uh, you know, this of course is completely ludicrous and insane, but it's the kind of pervasive subtext, if you like, to popular culture that needs to be, need be challenged. And that's why one of the ways in which you can uh, actually promote liberty is through things like simply uh, getting involved in fiction writing, working in the creative arts, working in, if you like, things like television, uh, radio, publishing, the whole range of areas which we don't think of normally as being in any way connected with politics. And that's enormously important because for everyone who's come to ideas of liberty through uh, reading Ludwig von Mises, there are you know, hundreds or more who come to them through reading works of fiction uh, or through watching uh, particular programs on television. And it's the domination of uh, the popular culture of today by, uh, I think, 
ideas that are hostile to liberty is one of the most important things to challenge. Right. Thanks for asking. So that's one, of the, that's one of the first things to say. What I would say in addition to that is uh, that there's also a point of what you might call everyday resistance, uh, which is a matter of challenging unexamined assumptions. Uh, this happens all the time. Uh, people will say things uh, in the pub, for example, or you will hear things uh, printed, you'll see things printed in the paper or uh, pub on the radio, and you should not let things go unchallenged. Uh, you, if you people come out with stuff that is uh, complete sort of nonsense or simply mistaken or misguided, uh, what you should do is not let this pass without challenge or check. You should actually say something about it. Simply writing letters to the press, for example, is an extremely effective way of keeping ideas in the public domain, challenging mistaken ideas, uh, promoting uh, right thinking, if you will. I have a friend called Don Boudreau, uh, an economist at George Mason University, uh, and Don writes every day, I think, about three or four letters to the editor, uh, some of which he's actually had published in a book, which I strongly recommend uh, to you. They're amazingly succinct and powerful expositions of clear economic thinking. And he actually has a very high strike rate. He has about one in five of these letters published. Uh, and you, may, you don't have to be aggressive. There's no point in being a complete arse, if you will. Uh, that is self-defeating. But if you're polite, courteous, respectful, uh, you can make sure that uh, ideas that people never have challenged very often do, in fact, get the kind of challenge uh, that they should get. And that's part of what you might call the wider public conversation. But I think the, the, the area where I think we need to do a lot more, uh, and the one I would sort of like concentrate now for the remainder of my we talk here, is the idea of institution building. Uh, libertarians uh, and you know, classical liberals, whatever you want to call us, spend a lot of time, I think, wringing our hands about how difficult it is to roll back the state. And I'm sure you'll hear from some of the other uh, panelists here about ways in which we can advance that goal. But I think that in some ways that's looking at it from the wrong angle. What we should be looking at is not so much rolling back government as growing the market, uh, growing the sphere, the size of voluntary cooperative private action. And one of the keys to this is uh, simply going out there and doing something, going out there and creating private institutions, voluntary institutions, through individual and collective action, which will address social problems and which will provide real-world alternatives uh, to state provision and supply. Uh, in education, for example, uh, it's, all, it's one thing to say that the state should get out of education. Certainly, that's an argument and a campaign that needs to be waged. But what is also uh, important, what we really should be doing, is actually going out there and creating private educational supply. Uh, educational institutions, not necessarily schools as such, but all kinds of uh, educational supply institutions, because to the extent that these exist, people will actually realize that this is a service that uh, can be provided much more efficiently, much more effectively, in a much more pluralistic way uh, than it can be by the state. Uh, similarly, there are all sorts of things you can do in the field of social welfare. It's one thing to criticize the welfare state, but as long as people can say to you, well, okay, what is your alternative, and you can't actually point to anything, particularly anything that you yourself have done, uh, then you're going to be at a very serious rhetorical uh, and argumentative disadvantage, with good reason, I must say. And the point is, there are all kinds of action that you can and should be involved in. If you're a libertarian and you think that private action is the way to go rather than government action, we have to be prepared to walk the walk as well as talk the talk. We have to be prepared to actually go out there and build up the kind of voluntary institutions that used to exist in such large numbers in this country, uh, the kind of cre institutions that were created by very often uh, working class people in the 19th century and early 20th century, for example, which provided a huge range of welfare and social services. It's time to actually go out there and recreate these kinds of institutions so that people can actually see that there's an other way of doing things, an actual embodiment in institutions and practices of the idea of a society of free and responsible individuals. And so I think that in many ways, one of the key strategies for uh, classical liberals, for people who like liberty and love liberty, is to actually go and build up the kind of institutions uh, that are needed. Now, I'll finally conclude by saying one thing. People will say, ah, Davies, uh, this is still idealistic because people can't afford to spend the time doing this, uh, or above all, they don't have the income because the state now takes 50% of the national income. And indeed, that is a major obstacle. But 
It's worth pointing something out. Because we are so much richer than we were in 1900, for example, when the state only spent 10% of national income, uh, the 50% that we have left now in terms of income that we actually dispose of, speaking of people in general in British society, is still much larger in absolute terms than the 90% that people had left by the government in 1900. So in terms of the actual resources at our disposal uh, as acting individuals, we actually have more capacity to act than was the case for our grandparents or great-grandparents. And we also have technologies available to us now which reduce the cost of organizing, connecting, creating institutions dramatically compared to the situation when you had to depend upon uh, the penny post uh, and those kind of telephones where you hold a, like, a stand and you have to put a thing to your ear like that. Uh, I can just about remember them. And the, the, the point is that, therefore, there's all kinds of actual opportunity for this kind of institution building and concrete action. And when it becomes associated with the ideas that inspire it, that's going to be an extremely powerful way of actually instantiating and realizing liberty, as well as making the ideas more widely uh, seen as credible uh, and right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the two questions we were asked to pick up on were um, how best to advance liberty. Is it through the political process, uh, the media, or think tanks? And my very short answer to that would be it has to be um, a combination of all three. And in all of the campaigns which um, I look after and run and what have you, we always have that sort of clear differentiation between the research, the media side, the grassroots, the digital. I think the trick is combining you know, all of those in the right way to actually advance the cause. But the, the particular question I want to pick up on for my 10 minutes is um, work with the political parties and with the political process. So that's quite an interesting area for classical liberals in the sense that obviously we have you know, two parties who are pretty close to us in some ways, the Conservative Party and UKIP. We have people within the... Uh, Labour Party and Liberal Democrats who share some of our values and actually trying to stay clear of those, you know, keep our distinct identity as well as advancing the cause is quite a, a tough thing to navigate. So I want to sort of pick up on a few of those lessons that I've learned over the past 10 years from all the campaigns, you know, particularly with reference to the Conservative Party and trying to push them on the one hand but also, you know, work with them on the other. So I'd say the theme throughout has been that sort of that struggle, that sort of conflict with the Conservatives, pushing them enough to get them our way, but also um, trying to work with them. And looking at the, the Taxpayers' Alliance, so going back uh, 10 years, that was at a time when the Conservative Party had basically made the decision that the only way it would get re-elected would be if it matched um, Labour's uh, spending plans. And they were quite clear on that. They'd seen how... Uh, Labour had been elected in 1997, and Gordon Brown had explicitly said he was going to match uh, the Conservative Party's tax and spend plans. And they thought they'd copy the same thing by saying they'd match Gordon Brown's higher taxes, higher spending. So there's a clear role for um, a taxpayer group. Now, for the, the TPA, some people in the Conservative Party liked us because we were a bit of an attack dog against um, Gordon Brown and against his high spending and his high waste and what have you. But on the other hand, when we pointed out that the Conservative Party, A, didn't have any plans to cut back on that spending, and B, were actually endorsing all of the tax rises uh, going through, they weren't so friendly to us. So we had that sort of that conflict um, with them. I would say similarly with the creation of um, Big Brother Watch, when that happened um, five years ago. Uh, that was at the time when, actually, David Davis, uh, I think, was still just um, shadow Home Secretary. And the Conservative Party at the time was quite friendly towards those people who wanted to advance the cause of civil liberties, who were against the surveillance state, wanted to protect privacy and what have you. They were quite strong on those issues um, at the time. But that wasn't actually really the prevailing opinion in many ways within the Conservative Party. And you know, since their you know, election into government, we've seen them basically revert back to a more authoritarian stance on all of these issues. So, for example, the um, database of all our emails, which they so you know, vehemently opposed when they're in opposition, they try to push through 
um, two years ago, Big Brother Watch was part of a coalition with No to ID and Liberty and Privacy International and what have you, who managed to stop that going through for a second time. But again, that caused a conflict between what Big Brother Watch were doing and some of the issues we were trying to push with the Conservative Party and the government at the time, and opposing that, um, you know, which is quite right, the right thing to do. Also, another cause of conflict would be with um, the, the No to AV um, referendum campaign. Again, I think the Conservative Party wanted to um, you know, be seen to you know, fight a no campaign against this, but they had the tension with the uh, Liberal Democrats, who are, of course, their coalition partners. They didn't want to be seen to be pushing too hard, so there's lots of talk about you know, David Cameron sitting on the fence and various cabinet ministers from the Conservative side of the coalition being allowed to campaign on the yes side and you know, pushing them into a situation where they opposed um, AV was quite a tough thing to do. And I remember going to uh, number 10 and telling them about the Labour guys who got on board as part of our coalition, you know, Prescott and John Reid and Margaret Beckett and what have you, and they were aghast because they could basically knew that once we split the Labour vote, then the referendum would be um, over for the, the yes side. So again, a bit of creative tension there with the um, Conservatives. And it goes through to um, Business of Britain as well. Again, you know, if you look at David Cameron's um, Bloomberg speech, where he says he wants to try and you know, renegotiate our membership of the EU and then put it to an in-out referendum, if you take him at his word, that's quite an interesting thing because he's put a deadline on the referendum of 2017. So there will be a line in the sand when the British people can actually have their say. But I, know, I don't think it's a big scandal to say there are people within... Um, you know, number 10 and within the Foreign Office and what have you, who are doing everything they possibly can to dampen down the change we get the e with the EU, try and present it as a big change, and then try and get the people to vote to stay in, despite the fact there won't be any substantial change in our relationship with the EU. So again, a source of tension between an outside campaign group, Business of Britain, and um, with the Conservative Party, who should be, in some ways, our natural allies. But also I'd say there's tension as well with the liberty movement when it comes to the um, adoption of um, new ideas. Um, I won't sort of run through all of the campaigns again, but when the, the TPA was set up, there were some people who accused us of sort of dumbing down the whole debate by talking about government waste and you know, not writing long um, academic tomes. Some people were saying that we were sort of dumbing it down too much and it wasn't actually advancing the cause of liberty, it was more just sort of gathering headlines in the uh, tabloids. But I would say there's a role for both. We need to have those sort of long tomes with proper stats, which are robust and what have you, and which will win over the commentariat and win over the civil service and win over decision makers. But you also need to sell that, that message to the public in a way in which they can easily digest. So it's all very well talking about the national debt being in the trillions and what have you, but if people can't actually understand what trillions are, and they need it breaking down into smaller levels of how much it is per household, or different examples of waste that have happened, that's also a necessary part of the exercise in terms of advancing um, liberty. Um, again, you know, small example from No to AV. Again, we're accused of you know, dumbing down the debate. And I think we've got to be very conscious of the fact that there are arguments which will you know, win over um, the commentariat, but if actually you're fighting a referendum or fighting an election campaign, what you're very interested in is basically winning over uh, voters and getting arguments which will appeal to them and which will sway their opinion to get them on your side. So just to wrap up, I would say that the key point for me has been that you know, if something is worthwhile doing and um, I find you know, the cause of liberty to be worth my while pursuing, you know, there is that element of struggle there. You know, struggle with um, the parties who should be closest to you on the political spectrum. Even struggle with some people within the establishment who sort of say that you're doing things in a very new way which isn't as good as the old way and trying to convince them that actually something new should be tried to advance the cause. That element of struggle is always there. And you know, it's not just the campaigns that um, you know, I've done, you know, even, dare I say, with Mark. You know, having been you know, head of um, comms for the Liberal Democrats, I think I'm right saying that all the other former heads of comms for the Lib Dems are now in the House of Lords, aren't they? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm 
not holding my breath. <laughs> <laughs> but Mark has taken the you know, courageous course. You could have got um, a cosy job in one of the big lefty think tanks, which get checks for like a million quid from the European Union and big checks from um, other public sector bodies and what have you, and had quite an easy life. And he could have you know, perhaps worked for you know, a pro-European part of the European Commission or something, and again, perhaps now be in the House of Lords. But if something is Why worth you doing... If something is worth um, doing, and I think advancing the cause of liberty is, there will be that element of struggle. But if we you know, keep up with the campaigning, you know, persist with our endeavours, I think we will win. And I think what's clear for the past 10 years of what I've been involved in it, we have seen the debate move our way. Matthew, thank you very much indeed. Um, Harry. Thank, thank you. Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations in 1776. It was pretty much the complete case for a free market. Not entirely, it was completed in the mid 19th century by Karl Menger, the founder of the Austrian school. So you have to ask yourself if the correct economics has been known for going on 200 years, and yet the society of the entire world has turned leftist, statist, collectivist for the last, oh, 120 years, then is the economic argument enough to win the minds and hearts of the electorate? No, it is not. You cannot win on economics. You cannot. If you could, we would have won by now. We have all the great economic theorists. John Stuart Mill began as the son of James Mill, a very rabid pro-capitalist economist. He ended his life as a socialist. Why? Because that's the story of the 20th century, late 19th century, early this millennium. People get the economics to some extent. They know that capitalism works. They saw what happened behind the Iron Curtain once the veil was lifted. They know freedom is practical. But why did they end up like Mill in socialism? Because of the morality of altruism that they all accept. It's the moral high ground that we have to reclaim. The morality of freedom is based upon the sanctity of each individual life. The fact that you own your own life, you are living for your own sake. You are not your brother's keeper and your brother cannot keep you. Men are not animals to be kept. Each man is an end in himself. Now, when you take that perspective, you reject the morality of altruistic self-sacrifice, the debate changes. The debate is no longer, well, what are we going to do about the most vulnerable in society? The debate then shifts to, what are we going to do to free the productive to earn their profits? I reject the question, well, what about the poor? That's not the primary question for political philosophy. That is not the primary question for morality. The primary question is, can a man in this society that you want live virtuously? And to live virtuously, you have to, he has to be able to choose. He has to be free. He, Virtue is impossible under physical force, under coercion, under compulsion. To live as man's nature requires, he has to be free. So the moral case for freedom is you cannot have morality under the rule of force. It's guns or morality. That's the only alternative. And then you have to make the point that government is a gun. How do you make that point? You simply ask as a matter of logic, what distinguishes government from any other social institution? What distinguishes government from the church, 
from a one of the voluntary charitable organizations that were mentioned, a union, a family. What distinguishes government? Government can pass laws. That is, it can tell you, do as we say or you go to jail. If you try to get out of jail, we may shoot you. And the ultimate uh, force of government, the ultimate penalty, is always death. They may not choose to use the full power, but any power that they use is backed up by force. Government laws are not suggestions. They're not advice. They don't say, well, if you don't follow these rules, you can't play. They are orders backed up by the police. So that it's very simple to demonstrate that government is force. And then to show that force is the enemy of moral choice. There's only one proper use of force, and that is to stop force. Force used to protect rights against those who would violate them, criminals and foreign aggressors, is retaliatory force, and that is what government has to provide. So there is a only the only limit, uh, limited and proper area of force is against force initiated by someone else. The purpose of force by government is to wipe out the force used by criminals and foreign invaders. Aside from that, everyone should be free. Morality demands that. There's no such thing as justice under coercion. There's no justice in forcing somebody to labor for another. Yesterday, we heard a proposal for our guaranteed basic unconditional income. And Milton Friedman earned my eternal disrespect for advocating the negative income tax. Well, what does that mean? That the government gives something for, uh, something for nothing to someone. It means the government points its gun at the head of some people and says, hand over some of your money. So the proposal for a basic income is a proposal to force people to work as slaves for part of their life, for part of their work week. They're working not for themselves, but as involuntary servants of someone else. Now that cannot be called justice. Part-time slavery is still slavery, and slavery is the height of injustice. You see, the, the moral perspective is what is going to carry the day in the end. The economics is wonderful. I'm writing a book on philosophy of economics. I'm fascinated by it. But it doesn't win the minds and hearts of the people we need to, to change. What does at least in my country, is an appeal to selfishness. Yes, that ugly word, selfishness, rational selfishness, living for your own sake, not sacrificing others, and not allowing yourself to be sacrificed. Everybody living as an independent person. Now, that works in my country to some extent, not universally for sure, because the tradition in America is the right to the pursuit of happiness, not the right to the pursuit of a free lunch, but the right to act on your own to better your own selfish happiness. That's what the Declaration says is a right along with the right to your life. So in my country, and I hope here, the works of Ayn Rand, who is the only strong defender of rational selfishness in the world, I hope the works of Ayn Rand can penetrate here the way they have in the US. Probably you're unaware that Ayn Rand's works have sold 25 million copies. It sold half a million, at one novel, Atlas Shrugged, sold half a minute, million copies about two years ago, in one year. The libertarian movement in the United States is majorly supported by 
the Ayn Rand corpus of writings. There's even a book, I don't know if you're familiar with it, entitled, It Usually Begins with Ayn Rand, written by a libertarian. I don't endorse that book, but the title is accurate. So what I'm here to do is to urge you to pick up the weapons that Ayn Rand has given you for instance, in this book, Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal, which is available for free on a table out there, Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal, that summarizes the entire perspective. People don't really know what capitalism is and means, and it's the ideal, the moral ideal. And I think it still says on the back, mm, no, it does not. The older edition said that capitalism is moral because it's the only system geared to the requirements of the survival of a rational being. Ayn Rand's philosophy is premised on life as a standard of value, man's life. And man survives by thought and productive work on the basis of that thought. That's why we have everything here, books, Factory-made clothing, seats, air conditioning, lights, it's all due to knowledge. It's all due to the thinking mind. That's what separates us from the caveman. So we have to, if we're in favor of man's survival as a, a human being, we have to be in favor of the mind being free to function, which means government does not interfere in production. Do I have much time or is that one more minute? One more minute. Well, I just want to give you the flavor of the kind of thinking that Ayn Rand offers that is not offered anywhere else. This is in a essay entitled The Anatomy of Compromise. She's identified a principle which names why I advocate that you not base your arguments on um, an appeal to solidarity or altruism or uh, the uh, environmentalism for that matter. She says there are three principles involving compromise and the first one is in any conflict between two men or two groups who hold the same basic principles, it is the more consistent one that wins. She gives an explanation on that, of that, but the application is, if you and the socialists agree, we're all in this together and the haves must be sacrificed to the have-nots, they are going to win, not you, because they're more consistent about implementing that. Thank you. Harry, thank you very much. Thanks to all of our panel.